thanks for the invitation, first of all. Um, it's a very unusual audience for me. Uh, and I'll try to do my best to entertain you for the next 45 minutes. There will be some science squeezed into the middle of it and some pictures that, you know, some of you will maybe see for the first time. But I'm sure we can guide you through it. And uh, are you familiar with Monty Python, like the original TV series? They always in between had this and now to something completely different. That's exactly what I feel like now uh, after the last two talks. So, but anyway, um, we'll look at bioenergetic membranes. Yeah, that's basically the header for the next 45 minutes. And I'll try to convince you that that's uh, basically the most fundamental thing that we have uh, in life and to understand life. And which goes all the way back to the origin of life, as we will see. Now, I work at the Institute for Molecular Evolution. I myself, uh, I am an evolutionary cell biologist. Now, what the heck does that mean? Uh, it's simple, you can do cell biology, yeah? So if you work in, in cancer research, if you study uh, animals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If, you wanna, if you're on crop sciences and you want to improve crop plants, you're basically also on cell biology. Evolutionary cell biology is doing pretty much the same, but not just on one model organism, but trying to take a bird's eye perspective on the things that happen uh, throughout life, if you want. And you can use uh, this quote here. Uh, I actually don't know who said it, um, but it's quite powerful. Yeah? So if you want to understand a society, yeah, you need to be aware of its history. And that is pretty much what evolutionary cell biology is about. If we want to understand a process in a cell that is occurring today or if a process goes wrong, which then at the end of the day, for instance, leads to cancer, we need to understand where the whole stuff comes from. So just to give you some you know, hallmarks that you can work with, and they're always nice party gimmicks, <laughs> depending on the party that you go to. But uh, so you have an idea, actually, of what we're talking about. Yeah? Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. Yeah? At the beginning, it was just, it's called fireball Earth. Yeah? So there was no way that life could have originated. It took about 300 million years uh, for the first water to condense. Yeah, so for Earth to cool down enough for water to actually participate and um, generate the first oceans. And we also know that then, rather quickly, uh, in terms of evolutionary thinking, uh, timescale thinking, life emerged. Yeah? So the first evidence that we have, it's pretty solid by now, is about 4 billion years ago. Yeah? So not too much time between the first water and life then emerging. This here, oxygenic cyanobacteria, is a really critical step in evolution, simply because that is when oxygen actually started to pearl up uh, in the environment, and it was invented by bacteria, yeah, so to produce uh, oxygen. And that was a very crucial step, because oxygen is what makes macroscopic life. So everything that you see with your plain eye depends on oxygen at the end of the day, to some degree. And then, about two billion years ago, so we had a major, major shift in evolution. That's where we went from very simple cells, so what you're all familiar with, you know, when you uh, buy sacrotan and it says it kills 99.9% .9 of all bacteria, that is what you could refer to as simple cells, bacterial cells. But two billion years ago, there was this major shift and the first complex cells emerged, which we uh, refer to as eukaryotes, and we ourselves are also part of the big eukaryotic uh, tree of life. And all life, no matter what you look at, uh, you can divide into these two uh, types of cells. Yeah? You have the simple prokaryotes, which fall into two kingdoms, the bacteria and the archaea, and you have eukaryotes to which we belong. Yeah? All eukaryotic cells basically look like that. Uh, the big difference between the two, yeah, in terms of this picture, is that eukaryotic cells, they have lots of compartments. Yeah? So they really, and that's where the word complex uh, cell stems from, their cytosol is filled with a lot of exciting stuff. And today we will be looking at the mitochondria a bit, which uh, some of you might have heard of as the powerhouse of the cell, but it does a lot more biochemistry than just producing uh, power for our cells. But at the end of the day, everything that you look at falls into these two classes. And it's quite striking if we look at the age of these two. Yeah? So we just learned that Earth is about 4.5 billion years old and then life emerged. And the first life that emerged was prokaryotic, it was simple, and it was these cells. Yeah? We do not have a time machine, but I'm pretty sure that if we would uh, invent a time machine and travel back in time, prokaryotic life 3.5 billion years ago looked pretty much like it, uh, what it looks like today. There is not much evolution, if you want, 
uh, in the structural complexity of the cells. But with eukaryotic cells, that changed dramatically. Yeah? So that's where what I just referred to as macroscopic life emerged. So everything that you see with your plain uh, eye, all the plants, all the algae, and all the animal life uh, is eukaryotic. And there's basically no limit uh, to its diversity, if you want. And this is, so at the next party, if someone asks you what is life all about, you can really kill the theme by saying it's all about a bioenergetic membrane in ATP synthesis. And that is exactly what you see here. So that is a membrane. It's basically what separates the compartment where life lives from the environment. Yeah, it's like a wall that separates the cell from its environment. And very early on, you had um, the emergence of this ATP synthesis machinery. There are billions and billions of these working in your body right now that synthesize ATP. Every day, the human male, yeah, 80 kilos heavy, generates about 60 kilos of ATP using these uh, tiny machineries. Yeah? And they depend on an electrochemical gradient, which we will get into. That's what I'm uh, showing here in plus and minus, and will come throughout the talk. You'll see this again and again. Yeah, so it's basically like a battery if you want. Yeah? You have a chemical gradient, high density of protons here, low density here. And this drives the motor. Yeah? It really is like a little shaft, and you have a rotor stator here which keeps the head uh, controlled. And this turning then synthesizes the currency um, or the, the energy currency of life, which is ATP. And life itself started off with generating ATP. We know that yeah? because if we take everything um, that is alive today and we sequence it and we look at what it's encoded, there are very few proteins which are universal, yeah? which you find in everything that is alive at the end of the day. And the ATP synthesis machinery, for instance, uh, is part of that. And this is where it all began. Yeah? At the bottom of the ocean, uh, what you see here, I think, I could be mistaken, this is about four or five kilometers deep. Um, these are the so-called black smokers. There are also white smokers. The only difference being, or the big difference being, uh, to be correct, is uh, the temperature of the water that uh, boils through. Yeah, so you can see this here. They can be several meters high, actually quite tall. We also know that they... Uh, age quite nicely, so some of them are 150,000 years old, and of course, if you think about the origin of life, you need time for it to evolve. But what you have here is a chemical reactor, yeah? and that's, that's where life began, we're pretty sure by now. Um, over the last 10 years, there's really been uh, lots of progress in terms of understanding how life began. And um, it began, began at this uh, chemical reactor, and there's a scheme of this here. So. You have to imagine if you take this rocky substance now and you cut through it, you will find little reaction chambers. Yeah, really like, like little test tubes if you want. And within them, the first molecules emerged. And this ATP synthesis machinery that I showed you really began very early on. Yeah, actually be first, before the first cells left the rocky substance. Yeah, because the origin of life at the end of the day is going from geochemistry to biochemistry. Yeah, that's the, the origin of life step. At the beginning, it was geochemistry. It happened at rocky surfaces. And then with the, with the membrane origin and the integrated ATP synthesis machineries that I showed you, so this electrochemical gradient, yeah, negative on the one and positive on the other side, cells could actually bubble out of that rock uh, and start to evolve in the way that was then, at the end of the day, also described by, by Darwin. Um, and so if you want, you go here. This is just picturing the hydrothermal vent. Never fall in love with the individual components on my slides. Um, it will break your heart <laughs> probably at the end of the day. Yeah. So this is just uh, as an overview. You see it that way. So hydrothermal vents, and we know that very early on delta psi, that is the one that you should remember for today, um, was there. Yeah. Because that is how energy is produced, and all of life depends on it. The, the few uh, species that we know that do not um, have this and do not make ATP, so the currency, the energy currency themselves, they basically then depend on others to do it for them. Think about parasites. Yeah, they are one example. But then the, the, the first crucial step was to evolve a membrane which would allow you to take this machinery that was part of a rocky surface and to uh, evade uh, or leave the rock and get your first types of cells, which is then the prokaryotic simple type. So again, you see, you know, it's just basically they're round, they're boring, uh, no cytosol, but they have delta psi at the, inner, uh, at the membrane. And so that is what prokaryotes looked like. Then you get the next step to complex life, eukaryotic cells. 
And this here is the magic thing that we'll learn about today, that is the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion was once a free-living bacterium. Yeah, so all of the mitochondria that you have, all of your cells do have them. These mitochondria were once free-living bacteria, and uh, they evolved into the mitochondrion. Life didn't stop there, and we will briefly also look at algae today. Um, so the photosynthetic organisms that are out there, uh, which produce oxygen for us uh, next to plants. And they also have, next to the mitochondrion, another compartment, which is of a prokaryotic origin, so it was once a free-living cell, and that's the plastid. Yeah? So if you would, unfortunately right here, there are no trees, but if you would look outside, and, or if you would look at a tree and everything that is green, basically stems um, from these little incorporations. Yeah? And then several steps of evolution followed. And at the end of the day, complex life is, a, is also an evolution of just adding more membranes to your cell, yeah? which allows, it's, it's like a house. Yeah? You can have a little hut, which just has one room and one kitchen. It's simple, but it does the trick. It would be this. But then, you know, you build a garage, and you build another room, and then you have a study room, and so on and so on. And it allows you to do more. Or think about a factory, it's the same, the same story. And cells in evolution did exactly the same. Yeah? Evolution works always in the same manner. You just add compartments and it allows you to do special biochemistry in your dedicated compartment. Now, this here, LUCA, uh, this is a term you will find also in the popular press, on the normal newspapers. Every now and then they also report about it because, of course, uh, the origin of life is a very religious topic. Yeah? If you think about it, every religion on this planet, what's its basic question? Where are we coming from? Where are we going? Yeah? And studying the origin of life, there is no difference at the end of the day. It's just a scientific perspective on the same story. So LUCA stands for the last universal common ancestor. So that is the cell that emerged first from the rock. Yeah? Uh, that evolved, for instance, the ATP synthesis machinery that makes the energy uh, for life. We get the split in the two domains. The bacteria in Archaea, this was uh, Karl Wöse in the 1970s. He basically described these two, uh, where the Archaea suddenly emerged. So you will always, uh, or very often still in the literature, find the bacteria, which then also contains the Archaea, but we now know these are two different kingdoms. And then we get something which is now uh, called the ring of life hypothesis. Yeah? So basically you had a fusion event of these two big domains of life, that then gave rise to the complex cells that I just showed you. Yeah? So the, the, the eukaryotes themselves. So it's a merging event of two domains that made then complex life possible. Now I'm changing gear a bit for the first time. So what you now see here, it's again a different scheme, but again just showing a, a eukaryotic cell. Here you've got the nucleus. Most of you will he have heard about that one, which encodes the genetic material. Um, for the entire cell. And here you have your mitochondria. Yeah? And mitochondria, when, they, when this evolutionary step began from simple to complex cells, the mitochondria still had like 5,000 genes. Yeah? So 5,000 genetic units that encoded a protein. But for reasons I can't explain today, um, it had to migrate to the nucleus, the genetic material, which then made it necessary for the proteins to be uh, retargeted to the organelle. Yeah? So that is a very basic and fundamental step that uh, happened. Um, and it's basically logistics. Yeah? If you think about it, uh, and today, of course, we all know that storing is expensive, so you try to uh, have everything on the road uh, to, in a certain sense. The cell is pretty much doing the same thing here. Yeah? You've got your, sto your information stored here. It gets translated and immediately transported to function uh, inside the organelle. Yeah? But this endosymbiotic gene transfer is uh, what was very important, and it is what still causes problems today, and we will see that at the end of the talk, because cancer cells, for instance, uh, struggle exactly uh, with one of those problems. Now, when these two cells merge, what I just showed you, yeah, um, in red, an archaeal cell, and in blue, a bacterial cell, there was a conflict of bioenergetic membranes. Yeah? So you've got your archaean, as I said, Basically, all of life makes ATP that way. So our host cell, which ended up to be our cells today, the outer membrane had also this delta psi. But the endosymbiont that came in, so this which evolved into the mitochondrion, also had it. Yeah? And that caused a conflict in the cell that had to be solved. 
because proteins that were now made in the cytosol and were supposed to be targeted by a postal address, like you just put a, post, uh, a letter into the post box and it has an address, same as with proteins, they have an address. But there was a conflict because suddenly there were identical machineries of prokaryotic origin and it, the cell had to evolve a method to distinguish between the two. And that's what we ended up with today. Um, that's what you have in all eukaryotic cells. So the one machinery in the plasma membrane was lost and um, replaced with something else. And our mitochondria today, they still have this delta psi. Yeah? So actually, Nick Lane calculated that. And if you take a square micrometer of inner membrane, yeah, the amount of energy that is flowing there is as much as a lightning bolt. Yeah? It's pretty dramatic. Um, if you eat a schnitzel and you would immediately uh, you know, within a second, take all that energy that is in the schnitzel yeah, and uh, translate that into the energy at the inner mitochondrial membrane, you would basically explode yeah, because it's a bomb. So it's a very regulated process. And that is also tightly uh, controlled. And that is also a problem what, uh, that happens downstream in cancer cells when we lose control over this bioenergetic membrane. Uh, it is a big problem. Um, this is just to illustrate, I mean, this probably summarizes 30 years of research from dozens and dozens of labs and millions and millions of pounds, euros and dollars, you name it, to uh, unravel the import machinery that, so for proteins that are targeted to the uh, organelle from the cytosol to the matrix, so across the two membranes that separate this compartment. And the, the crucial part, uh, what I'm going to be talking about, is this delta psi here. Yeah? And we do know that proteins that want to go from A to B here, they need this delta psi at the inner membrane. Yeah? So they depend on this electrochemical gradient to be imported, because it's, at the end of the day, electrophoresis. Yeah? So it's attracted um, to the cytosol. And for that, they have N-terminal targeting sequences. Yeah? So your protein is made in the cytosol on ribosomes, and it comes out, and at the very beginning, yeah, it has a postal code. Yeah? It's like a, a number code. In this case, it's an amino acid code, um, which tells the protein in the cell where to go. And if we look at, however, at, and this is what I meant by the bird's eye perspective on, on cell biology, the types of mitochondria that you find over the tree of life is very divergent. Yeah? So in blue, this would be your mitochondria. Yeah? That is in all of your cells. That's what they look like, human. But you have uh, other forms which carry out other biochemistry. And interestingly, some of them, which you especially find in parasites, um, like Giardia, which you probably, some of you have had without knowing, you can get it at a salad bar. Yeah? If the salad wasn't cooled properly, it's a uh, nasty parasite from which you get diarrhea. They have very reduced forms of this mitochondria. Yeah? And the interesting part is these mitochondria, they have lost, this is again indicated here by plus and minus, they have lost delta psi at the inner mitochondrial membrane. Because like I just said at the beginning of the talk, they don't make ATP anymore by themselves. They are parasites. They just take it from you. Yeah? So you make ATP basically for them. But interestingly, they still have import machineries. Yeah? So they, they still need to import proteins from the cytosol into their organelle to make biochemistry. Yeah, but they do that, surprisingly, without delta psi, which our mitochondria, we know that for 20 years now, they depend on that delta psi. And what we could see is, this is basically a very, very common thing that you have in evolution, and evolutionary reduction. Yeah, so you have your very complex machinery, and uh, it's also something that, again, uh, in the normal world is uh, pretty common at the moment. That's simplify your life, yeah? don't have too much stuff, and so on and so on. Basically, parasites uh, have followed that rule quite a, for quite a while now because they've also reduced their biochemistry and they have reduced their import machinery. But with it, they have also reduced this postal address that I just mentioned. Yeah? So it's no longer five digits long. It's now only three digits long if you want. And also, not only have they lost delta psi at the inner membrane, but th this targeting information in the front has also lost its charge. Yeah? So amino acids can be charged, basic, acidic, um, same is true uh, for proteins. And they do no longer have that because this postal address doesn't need to interact with the delta psi at the inner membrane. And what we, this is now lab work, and I'm not going to get into the details. There's no way that I can explain that in two minutes. But basically what we could show here is 
that this is conserved from, this is uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, so it's a close relative of the fungus that makes your beer. Yeah. This here is the parasite that we work with, tri Trichomonas vaginalis. But at the end of the day, what we could show is that over these very distant evolutionary time scales in terms of the organisms that we're working with, this mechanism of protein import is conserved. So there must be something in these yeast cells, which are also evolutionary related to us. Yeah, that's also why yeast is a model system to a certain degree still for um, things that interest us in, in, in human biology. It is conserved across these uh, divergent lineages, which means it's a fundamental principle. Yeah. So again, um, to explain it, anything that you find conserved in an animal cell and in a plant cell, you know it was there in the common ancestor. Yeah? It was there right at the beginning, and it must be very important uh, if it was kept up until today. So we know that whatever is happening here at these organelles is conserved. And what is interesting is, and that is what I'm trying to imply here in terms of how do we should, should be doing research today, this is contradicting the textbooks, but you can only find out if you not only work on uh, model organisms. So to close the loop of the first part, when we had the simple cells yeah, and your free living bacterium came in to evolve into the mitochondrion, you had this very simple situation. Yeah? You had simple channels, simple pores, but you had a delta psi at the inner membrane. You evolve into a rat. Yeah, and your red mitochondria now have this complex machinery, lots of regulation, when is what imported, etc. So you have lots of import um, receptors, for instance. Yeah, it's called the receptor platform. You have delta psi, and then you get to reductive evolution. Yeah, so your parasite that now no longer makes ATP by itself, but just sucks it up from you. And it goes back to the original state. Yeah, and also to a targeting mechanism that is independent of this delta psi which uh, we should analyze, especially as we see later, because it is something that you also see in cancer cells. Now, as I already mentioned very early on, uh, evolution didn't stop with just one endosymbiont. What you see here is a rough schematic of the origin of anything eukaryotic, so complex cells, that lives from photosynthesis. Yeah? So that can basically fix atmospheric carbon and make material. At the end of the day, I walked past the city and it said somewhere, uh, this burger is made out of plants. Everything is made out of plants. Yeah, I mean, also we, if you just eat meat, at the end of the day, the meat came from plants, so everything <coughs> is plants. And that is where it began. Yeah, so very early on, you had your little protist swimming around in a pond, and it was feeding on other bacteria. Yeah, that's basically what most of the protists do out there. They just feed on other uh, prokaryotic life. One got stuck and evolved into the plastid. Yeah, and you get divergent lineages. They are very, very interesting because one of them, has anyone ever had malaria? I had it. It's no fun. You had malaria? Good on you. <laughs> so down here, yeah, the, the agent that causes malaria is Plasmodium falciparum. Yeah? That was once a free-living algae. Yeah? Not many people know that, but uh, that is why it is really important. And there's, of course, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They have put three digits and millions uh, into malaria research by now, I think, and, and really a lot of progress has been made due to that. But that was also an organism that had this compartment. And the thing is, that compartment, like the mitochondria, needs to import proteins, yeah? Because it also had to move its DNA to the nucleus. And surprisingly, um, you got to believe before tonight, these two machineries work in very much the same way. Yeah? So the question then arises is, if you have two cities in Switzerland yeah, that carry the same name, how does the postal man know where to target uh, its, uh, the letter if it doesn't have a proper address? Yeah? And surprisingly, what we also know is that the addresses that are used for these different compartments are also very much the same. So what we found out is that again, it's charge. Yeah, that makes this uh, important difference in, in terms of making the distinction between is it a mitochondrial protein or is it a plastid protein. What you see here, Arabidopsis thaliana, this is the model plant in every lab on this planet. Yeah? Hundreds and hundreds of labs are working on Arabidopsis thaliana. This here is now your postal address, yeah? so the N-terminal sequence that tells the protein where it belongs in the cell. This is just one gene that is encoded in Arabidopsis. And the, uh, the overall charge, if you calculate it, is plus two. Yeah? So it's positively charged. 
And in Arabidopsis, what happens? The targeting is dual. Yeah, so the cell this is very very efficient. Yeah, this is it's a smart solution because the protein is encoded only once. It gets made once, and then 50% get targeted to one destination, and the other 50% go to the other destination. Yeah, so very elegant if you want. This here is rice. Yeah, so the very rice that you buy at the supermarket. Evolution has chosen a different path. Yeah, um, the protein isn't encoded once, but it's encoded four times. No particular reason for that. Um, but two copies we know go to the mitochondria and two copies go to the plastid. And the only difference at the end of the day are these arginine residues, so these amino acids. And these amino acids here, they are positively charged. Yeah? So your positive charge here in the postal address is 3.5. Here it is 1.5 and 1. And basically that is the crucial difference that tells the protein where to go in your or in the plant cell in this case. <coughs> yeah, so it's charge that makes the core. And uh, one lab quite a few years back, actually this is now the malaria agent, yeah, so plasmodium falciparum, the very one that causes malaria, they made synthetic constructs. Yeah, that's the beauty about modern biology, um, you can just make this synthetically in the lab. And they made skinny, slinky, kinky thing, and they also made it will never target plastid. And just added that to a marker protein, and they could see, and that's also what they concluded in the paper, that basically, again, it's charge yeah, that makes the call. I mean, it's very uh, evident, I think, that these sequences, you know, they, I mean, there are lots of algorithms uh, that you can, you know, browser-based also, that will tell you where your protein is going, but uh, these English sentences, and there are many more. One in the supplementary of that paper is, Jeff is an idiot. And um, I don't know which Jeff that was, but it, it just shows you that at the end of the day, you know, we, we often, we think very complex and think there must be a complex uh, reason behind uh, the, the, these targeting solutions, but at the end of the day, it is charge. And forget the top part for now. Um, this is just in Arabidopsis now, showing you how dominant this charge call is actually. So these are 1,668 proteins that have empirically been tested in the lab. Yeah, so people have cloned it, put a tag on it, and have checked where this goes in the cell. Those proteins that are nuclear encoded and go to the plastid, they carry a charge on average in the first 20 amino acids of plus one. Yeah? Really, really small um, margins. Those that go to the mitochondria, this is the sequence that is, is shown here, they have a very high positive charge. And this is what we know from the textbooks for, for 20 years. So very conserved. Yeah? Also, our mitochondria will look exactly the same. And those proteins, 72 that we are aware of and have tested in the lab, that are dually targeted, so where one um, product is made and 50% is targeted to the plastid and 50% to the mitochondria, they have uh, a charge which is right in the middle. Yeah? It's uh, almost too good to be true, to be, to be honest. And so to summarize that part before we slowly uh, go into the cancer world briefly, this is what it roughly looked like. Yeah? So this here would be your normal textbook garden variety eukaryotic cell. Proteins are encoded on its DNA in the nucleus. Proteins are made in the cytosol. And those that have to go to the mitochondrion, this is just a charge indicator like on your mobile phone if you want, they are highly positively charged. Yeah? So they're, they're, they're fully loaded to go to the mitochondrion to basically pass the inner mitochondrial membrane which is so highly energized. Then we get evolution and the uh, acquisition of a plastid which comes in. Now we have a bit of a conflict because proteins are made and they can either go to the plastid or to the mitochondrion. And evolution has um, picked this intermediate path. Yeah? So those that go to the mitochondrion, again, positively charged, plastid just a bit. And those that go to both destinations simultaneously, they carry this intermediate charge. Yeah? So it's, it's a very elegant um, solution that evolution has basically uh, picked there. This here would be your complex uh, cell-like plasmodium falciparum. Here it's a very special case where the plastid actually resides within another compartment, extra membranes. The only thing that is important for us, because this is, this is the beauty, because nature has done all the experiments for us, now that the plastid is no longer at the same destination as the mitochondrion, yeah? so you could say this city is in Switzerland, this city is in Austria, so the postman doesn't have that problem. And now the uh, targeting information can actually have positive charges again. Yeah? So because there's no evolutionary constraint or selection on keeping the charges low. Yeah? It's, it's quite elegant, but complicated, I admit. 
So now to switch a bit, um, what does this actually mean in the lab? Yeah, so this is nice. We now know there's a charge plays a role, and, and does, is there anything uh, alive you know, that really makes use of it in an, an elegant way? Chlamydomonas reinhardtii. Has anyone heard of this algae? Has anyone heard of Mercedes-Benz? <laughs> right. Hydrogen production as an alternative energy source. So Mercedes-Benz, uh, I believe, was the company that really put a lot of money also into Chlamydomonas research because this is an algae that produces hydrogen. Yeah? It just bubbles off under certain environmental conditions. This algae makes hydrogen yeah? just for free. It, it's a waste product for this algae that just needs to get rid of it so it bubbles into the environment. And of course, it would be fantastic yeah, if we could uh, make use of that. But anyway, so what, what also happens here is when this algae uh, produces hydrogen, it switches from one metaboli metabolism to another. Yeah? It goes from aerobic to anaerobic growth. Yeah? So here it respires oxygen like we do. Uh, in the other biochemistry, it doesn't. And this is your plastid, this is your mitochondrion. We know that some of the enzymes uh, that are involved in this hydrogen production, they go to both uh, compartments. Yeah? So just like the, the proteins that I talked to you about, they have this dual targeting in Arabidopsis. Yeah? They, they go to both, but we don't know exactly um, what is happening. One of them would be PFL, for instance, here. And also, uh, they produce lactate. And we'll get back to that. Uh, does anyone of you know when our body produces lactate? Exactly. Sports is, Sports are yeah, when you really run fast for a short, every sprinter, yeah, there's a very big difference in the biochemistry in the body of a sprinter and a long distance runner. And it actually has to do with lactate. And we'll get back to that uh, when we talk about cancer cells. That's why I'm mentioning it. But so the biochemistry here somehow happens in both, but we don't know exactly what's going on. And what we are working on right now is basically really coming from this evolutionary perspective and noticing that this parasite that we were working on was doing something differently than uh, our yeast cell. What we see here is when this biochemistry switches, in red you see the mitochondria, yeah? so the powerhouse of the cell. And this dye that we use to label these mitochondria, this depends on the flow of electrons yeah, at the inner membrane. So the inner membrane has to be energized. It's like you know, if your plug is dead, your light bulb will not glow. This is very much the same way, only when the membrane is energized, the dye fluoresces. And so when we switch the biochemistry, we can see that the mitochondria turn off. Yeah, they no longer produce ATP, and they go from ATP producing to non-ATP producing. But this is the state where they also produce hydrogen. And what we now saw uh, is, here again, this would be your N-terminal targeting sequences, yeah, so your postal code. And the charges displayed here. Um, but to summarize this figure, what we see is when we go from aerobic to anaerobic um, physiology, these protein basically shift localization. Yeah? This is the control, scientific control. We don't need to get into that today. Aerobic cell, so our protein only goes into the plastids. Yeah? So you see this green curve, and then you see this uh, cyano based curve. But the red one, which is the mitochondria, there's no co-localization. Yeah? But we take the very same cells, the very same protein, there's no altering in the targeting information itself. We put it into anaerobic condition, so where delta psi uh, switches off and the inner mitochondrial membrane switches off. And suddenly, the plastid can import um, the protein. And this is pretty dramatic, yeah? because it basically is just the physiological change of the cell that now tells the protein where to go. And this is undescribed in the literature as uh, we know today. Just last year, um, very important protein in mitochondrial and aging control. Yeah? Because th the one thing that determines when you die is your mitochondria. Yeah? Sorry to tell you that. Nothing that you can do about it for now. But there's a protein that changes localization from the outer to the inner side of the mitochondria. And we now know that this is also regulated by delta psi which is also connected to cancer, because what happens um, when your mitochondria die, they also no longer produce ATP, they secrete certain substrates, and it tells the cell that's, that's the end of the story. And pink, uh, this, this one protein, it's called pink, can then be imported. Yeah? So it's, it's again just switching off or on electricity that makes the call on what's happening in the cell. And getting back to this scheme, I already explained it, so I don't have to do it again. 
enzymes that work in both compartments, lactate production, yeah? anaerobic metabolism, a complete switch in physiology. It's like you changing your diet, yeah? it, does, it does change your body, pretty much the same uh, is happening here. But this is also what's happening in cancer cells. Yeah? And that is really where I always urge, I sometimes supervise PhD students at the clinic, uh, that work on cancer, and it's always it's the one question that I ask them, what do all cancer cells have in common? Yeah? And what they all have in common is what we, or some of you might know as the Otto Warburg effect. Yeah? It was described, it's a paper that is 60 years old, and it's still one of the best reads in science that you can get. Uh, it's, it's, it's visionary. This man lived way too early, to be quite honest. But what you have in, these, in every cancer cell is this excessive production of lactate although there is oxygen. Yeah? So someone just mentioned sports, so when you do a rough sprint, what your muscle cells there have, or, or the problem that they have is, you can't respire enough oxygen, you can't breathe fast enough to supply your muscles with oxygen. Yeah? So that's when, you, when your muscles say, okay, I still have to work hard now, um, I produce lactate, uh, although there is some oxygen, but just not enough. This happens in every cancer cell, but on a much, much higher level. Otto Warburg described this, uh, and he called it actually the aerobic glycolysis. Yeah? And it's quite dramatic because what's happening here is this very thing that you always hear about as the powers of the cell no longer makes ATP. Yeah? So your cancer cells, they don't make ATP for you anymore. Yeah? And of course cause other havoc. So it's a bioenergetic reprogramming of the cell, what is happening there. And this is also a very common diagnostic. Yeah? So a bit like what I just told you about in terms of this dye that fluoresces uh, when there is electricity. Here you have um, basically a, a substrate that is only uh, turned over by these cancer cells and can then be, be monitored. But it is the one thing that is universal to cancer cells. And it all has to do with the mitochondria, and it all has to do with what I told you right at the beginning, yeah, um, your membrane and your electropotential, because this would be your healthy mitochondria, which hopefully all of your cells will look like right now. So you have your nucleus, proteins are made, they get imported, and this uh, mitochondria is nice to you, and it makes ATP at the inner mitochondrial membrane. Cancer cell mitochondria completely switch their behavior, yeah, and all of them do. Uh, what is also shown here, roughly the whole morphology of the mitochondria changes, but importantly, the inner mitochondrial membrane now actually is hyperactive, yeah? so it really ramps up the electron transport, but it no longer produces any ATP, yeah? so it's really controversial. It would actually have the capacity to make even more ATP, but it doesn't do it anymore. We don't really know why that is the case, yeah? but this is happening in all of the cancer cells. And of course, a uh, big, big problem, it increased, uh, you have an increased reactive oxygen species production. Yeah? So, you know from some advertising, uh, drink orange juice, it has antioxidants, yeah? so that is stuff that actually um, then takes care of reactive oxygen species. Yeah? But cancer cells produce way too much of that, and that all is connected with an overrun bioenergetic uh, inner mitochondrial membrane, or most of it. And generally, when we look at cancer, to get slowly to the end uh, of the talk, is cancer is antisocial. <laughs> yeah? uh, it is really antisocial to your body because take liver cancer, brain cancer, breast cancer, you name it, it doesn't matter. Yeah? Um, your cells in your body, they are organized, they have a duty, and they usually work perfectly fine. I mean, there are all little cells that you know, act together in a consortium. Yeah, so it's, it's very social behavior of these individual little cells. Yeah? Every cancer type, the cancer cells go hyper-egoistic. Yeah? They change um, their whole morphology. And many of them will... So these are real pictures of cancer cells. Yeah? This is a macrophage actually trying to eat. I mean, look at that poor macrophage trying to feast on this uh, cancer cell. It can't do anything about it. And what you see here, these little arms spreading out, that is... Um, Something that, you know, for me as a bio basic biologist also, is very reminiscent of amoeboid morphology. Yeah? So the very things that crawl around, uh, which we imagine what the first eukaryotic complex cells looked like, it goes back to this state. Yeah? It just goes back to being a single cell. It just thinks about itself. And these arms span out simply because it is a, a bit of a uh, parasite now in your body because it just feasts um, <coughs> upon your tissue. Yeah? And that has to do um, with the mitochondria because this uh, it goes to cytosolic um, 
glycolytic pathway and it just needs to feed a lot more because the mitochondria through the uh, ATP, through the um, inner membrane in the electrochemical gradient, no longer produce ATP. Yeah? So that uh, is what hap what's happening there. Briefly getting back to endosymbiotic gene transfer, and I mentioned that uh, earlier on, that that will be something that we will touch up on when we get into cancer. Yeah, So the shifting of genetic code from your compartment to the nucleus. Yeah, This had to happen for DNA protection. Uh, it's complicated. Um, <clears throat> it has to do with the mother of my old mitochondria, which will be the last slides. Yeah, but So this happened throughout evolution. It is actually still happening. It's been measured in plants. I think every thousand generations or so, one gene uh, migrates from the plastid, in that case, to the nucleus. Yeah, But this happened throughout evolution. And we now thousands of proteins that need to go here are encoded here. In cancer cells, um, this endosymbiotic gene transfer goes bad yeah, because it's over-rammed. Yeah? The mitochondria and the cells, they constantly break up and they release their DNA freely into the cytosol. And unfortunately, that then finds its way in with hyperspeed, if you want, uh, also into the nucleus. Yeah? So what you see here, these are actually the, the human chromosomes, two, three, five, and so on and so on. And every little bridge that spans yeah, is a mitochondrial DNA piece that found its residence now within the chromosomes. And you can imagine that that completely distorts and um, the function of the chromosomes. And that is the problem also of cancer cells. And it is actually, to me, completely surprising how a cancer cell can survive, yeah, that the whole uh, machinery still works. But that is something that is happening also in all cancer cells, yeah? so that these mitochondria, the ones free-living bacterium that evolved into the mitochondria, here constantly break up, release their DNA, and it um, slowly but surely destroys the uh, chromosomes. So two more slides and we're done. But this is a very interesting piece, uh, I think, which is also in biology completely. People think about it, but we are not really exploring it and we don't really know what's going on. Um, in age research, this is a big topic. I put this in just a few hours ago because today is International Women's Day, right? The mother of all mitochondria, because the mitochondria that all of you have, and some of you might know that because this is also every now and then in the popular uh, press, they always come from mommy. Yeah? Daddy contributes no mitochondria to the baby. Yeah? So that's what you see here. Here you have the egg cell uh, from the female side, and here you have the sperm cell from the male side. The sperm cell has hundreds and thousands of mitochondria here in its flagellum, yeah, which is basically the motor. Yeah? So the Sperm cells uh, are really good speeders. And they, the, the mitochondria sit right there at the neck, yeah, and they power this motor. But when fertilization occurs, actually only the head part is released into the oocyte. Yeah? The mitochondria, they flow away and get um, degraded within hours. We also know that if by accident a male mitochondrion finds its way during uh, fertilization, into the oocyte, it also gets marked. The mother cell immediately recognizes that, says, nope, yeah, gets marked and off to degradation. So every baby that is born gets born with mitochondria from their mother. Yeah? And this has been going on since animals have been evolving. Yeah? It's a very ancient process. Um, in at least vertebrates, uh, this is also a universal principle. Now, when you think about it, how is this actually possible. Yeah? And with that, I will leave you uh, very soon because uh, we have something which we call uh, the mitochondrial bottleneck. Yeah? So this very bacterium that evolved into the mitochondria, billions of years of evolution, um, now we're stuck with it. Yeah? It's in the cytosol. The mother always passes it on to the babies. And you have it here. Yeah? And this is a beautiful piece of biology because already when the woman matures, so during embryogenesis, within their own mother, there are very likely cells put aside for the oocytes that all of the females in this room still have. No matter how old you are, you always have oocytes. They stop being released, but that's a different story. Yeah, but there seem to be mitochondria that get put aside that never turn on their bioenergetic membrane. Yeah, it's always switched off. So the powerhouse is never a powerhouse. Simply because if you would have been as a baby, you would have taken your own DNA and you sequence it. It is pristine, yeah, sanft wie ein Baby Popo. 
And there's nothing wrong with it. And then you sequence at every stage and you see that this mitochondrial DNA accumulates mutations. And it cannot do anything else but accumulate mutations because it's no longer a free living bacterium that can you know, recombine its DNA like we do it during se sexual reproduction. So it is stuck. And it seems to be, but we don't really have an answer how this is happening, that the mitochondrial code um, is protected within uh, the mother mitochondria. Yeah, that still uh, is awaiting its discovery. So, to sum it up, I always like to make that pretty short um, because you can ask me downstream if you want. But a few things that I hope you can take home today. Bioenergetic membranes, they are, they are as old as life itself and they basically make life. Yeah? It's the very definition of life is delta psi and a bioenergetic membrane that produces ATP. They're few and exercise control. Yeah? So, I gave you one example with this protein targeting within the cell where delta psi can make the call on whether a protein is imported or not. And what I also mentioned at the end of the day, when it switches off, you die. Um, and that's when your mitochondrion has accumulated too many mutations and just cannot be repaired anymore. Your whole cells crash. And then the mitochondria also send out the final sec signal uh, of death. And this is also true in all of the protests. Life is short. Yeah, that is definitely true. So uh, make the best of it because it's Friday. And the one thing in terms of bird's eye perspective, uh, the evolutionary perspective can help you a lot. And that's not only true for biological questions, but in general. Because I recently had, uh, I gave a talk at a school and they asked, you know, we suddenly, of course, you always talk about Brexit and Trump and so on and so on. And then we talked about the RFD. And the one thing that they all have in common is they are full of climate deniers. Yeah. Evolution can also, for me, it's very simple to understand why we have climate deniers. Yeah. Because 99% of our evolution, yeah, we had to think for one winter. Yeah, one winter, that's it. Yeah, our brains are just not wired to think about something that's happening in 20 years. Politicians, yeah, they think in four or five uh, years simply because of election periods. But um, that is why you have climate deniers, because our brains are just not made to think about something that might happen in 100 years, because, of course, that is not my germline's problem. And with that, 